All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Stowe. I'm going to give a couple minutes for uh, some other people to join in, and then we can get started on the uh, presentation. Um, just to give you some background, um, I've been in uh, print marketing uh, for well over 25 years, um, and I've dealt with a lot of progressive and Democrat campaigns over the years on all of their printed materials, direct mail, and other uh, uh, components that accompany that. Um, I'm also well immersed in the progressive um, and Democrat community because I do a great deal of uh, volunteer work on uh, gun violence. Um, after the shooting in Sandy Hook in my hometown, I actually co-founded a national nonprofit uh, to prevent gun violence. Um, so that's kind of integrated me into this community even further. Um, so I'm going to get started now on this and we can um, then take some questions at the end. I've tried to pack in as much content as possible. So I'm going to share my screen now and then I'll start working through a PowerPoint presentation. Bear with me one second as I bring that up. All right, so now you should be able to see my presentation. Um, and I will start going on this. So what we're going to do is talk about materials for a campaign. And there's a lot to cover in that. Uh, we're going to talk about printed materials, which include signs, promotional items, and more with a focus on direct mail. Um, that includes information about designing things, creative choices, putting together mail plans, deciding on sizes and materials, and how to choose a universe, which would be the uh, people that you're mailing to, and how to choose a vendor and other related information. So as we start this process, um, the first thing you really want to think about is your branding, because you cannot have any printed materials, signs, graphics, or even digital materials without having a brand. So there's no effective marketing without a defined brand. But in politics, that distinction isn't always clear. Um, what you don't want to do is just simply create a logo and then consider that, logo's, that logo to be the candidate's brand. Um, a logo is not a candidate's brand in and of itself, but a lo good logo design can certainly convey candidate's brand, um, but there's more involved. Adopting a political party's identification as your brand is also a mistake. In today's political climate, it's imperative that a candidate develop his or her own, her own identity, and every aspect of a campaign should support the overall brand look and feel, as well as the candidate objectives. A great example of this recently would be the um, race that was to replace George Santos in uh, New York's congressional district on Long Island. And Tom Swasey uh, did an excellent job. Um, he did a great job of identifying who he was and how he was going to handle the most pressing issues in his district. He didn't come out with um, parrying the Democrat uh, National Committee um, talking points, um, and he was very responsive to the voters in his district. Um, so when we're also talking about that, we're talking about brand development. It requires an in-depth analysis into the overall candidate's goals, objectives, and taking into consideration the candidate's beliefs, his voice, his essence, and differentiators. Um, once you gain a clear perspective about your candidate's brand, you can then be ready to tie everything together, unifying that brand um, using a range of components, including that logo, memorable slogan or tagline, eye-catching imagery, and content that really lets um, the constituents know who your candidate is. Um, now, when we're talking about creating a brand and using that for messaging and marketing, um, you want to incorporate as all, the, all these elements into an overall campaign positioning its first step to be marketing your candidate. And messaging and marketing must be consistent and true to the brand. For example, is your candidate steady or edgy? Is your candidate disruptive or do they play by the book? Does he look and feel, does the look and feel of your digital and print collateral reflect the candidate's brand? Uh, more importantly, does it reflect an appeal to the voters that you are looking to have support this candidate? Effectively using all of the assets and even liabilities is necessary to cohesively com communicate your candidate's brand positioning, identity, and brand essence. Um, a good example of taking a liability and effectively turning that into an asset, you have to look no further than the current Biden-Harris campaign. Um, we know that Joe Biden is old, and for a while the campaign seemed to try and ignore it and pretend it was not an issue. However, there is no point in trying to ignore or deny this point and let their opponent run with this narrative. Instead, own it embrace it as a positive, um, disarm its use as a negative. 
Um, with age comes experience and ability to get things done, as is clear by the accomplishments of this um, of this administration over the past three years. Now, when we're talking about what um, applications, once you have a brand and messaging ready, um, you're applying that to both digital and conventional channels, which could include on digital side, email, social media, ads, and other digital um, assets. And on the more conventional side, we're talking about signs, printed collateral, and direct mail. Um, those are your campaign's main vehicles um, to, us, to identify who the candidate is and communicate with your potential audience. Um, one really important thing to consider is an event. Um, your candidate's campaign launch is a key introductory moment. It's important, this important event should be designed to unveil and showcase your unique um, candidate's identity. And the event, every event thereafter should also incorporate that brand identity, whether it's a rally, a door knocking initiative, or a town hall, or even a donor event. Each event and appearance should, rely, should relay the candidate's brand and personality. So if your events are chaotic and lack organization, your audience might assume that your candidate is the same, damaging his or her image. If your events are well organized, have welcoming team of volunteers, um, and distribute information complementary of your candidate and brand identity, then you're off to a great start. The bottom line is a campaign consists of many moving parts, and a strong political brand identity not only makes it easier to create compelling content, um, but also the messaging flows more naturally through that. So the, there's a bunch of components to consider as you start to get into both digital and traditional means of communication. Uh, those include budget, who you want to work with, your message, literature, and some, some other specifics. So when putting together a campaign, having a good understanding of what campaign materials you're going to need and how that fits into your budget is a vital thing to understand. Uh, you should be looking to figure out who you're going to work with and rely on well ahead of time. A campaign should not be figuring out who their partners and vendors are as you start going into September and the campaign kicks into high gear. So clear, consistent, and easy to understand messaging that speaks directly to your voters should always be the goal with any kind of messaging vehicles. Um, there are many tools that a campaign can harness uh, to get their message across. And some of those include digital channels, campaign literature, signs, direct mail, and other vehicles will allow, that will allow them to gain visibility in front of their potential voters. So starting with a budget, that's really something you want to do as early as possible. Know what money you have available for the campaign. And when doing so, do not overestimate what your fundraising is going to bring in. Be conservative and realistic when you're doing this. Um, if you find out that you have a little extra money in the budget as election day approaches, then you can simply apply that to get out the vote um, efforts. But you definitely do not want to plan for something that you then can't afford. Um, once you have a good idea of what your budget number is going to be, then you have to go about dividing that up for the various costs that you'll have, which can include fundraising costs, staffing, website, social media, graphic design, direct mail, signs, printed collateral, and more. Um, then you want to make a list of all the items that you think you would like to have and get pricing on those. When it comes to costs for design, printed materials, direct mail, signs, and related items, make sure that you work with a source that knows what they are doing and that you can trust. Um, you will also want to communicate with those people about what your plans are as best as you can. Now, also, when you're pricing things out, pricing out a sign and then a palm card and then a mail campaign is not how you want to go about things. What you really want to do is to use economies of scale and get your budget together. So you want to let the vendor know of all the items that you're thinking of doing and will likely do because you're likely going to get much better pricing on a package than you will on individual items. Let's just keep moving along here. So an import, a really important consideration is who to work with. Now, that, that's one of the most important logistical considerations you can make as you're putting your campaign together. And all vendors are most definitely not created equal. Um, you want someone who has experience in the campaign space. You want someone who you can trust to do quality work, someone who communicates well, and who you are comfortable working with. That's not always going to be the same for every campaign. Um, the most valuable thing that you have is your time and lost time due to mistakes on a campaign material or you wasting time going back and forth with a vendor is a frustrating process. And also it allows it, it makes you lose your most valuable commodity, which is time. 
So what you want to do is look for others who have campaign experience and get referrals. Uh, look to vendors that who that who the people that you trust trust and rely on. Um, it's also a good idea to find a partner who can handle everything under one roof as opposed to going to multiple places. So aside from the obvious time savings and simplicity of this approach, um, you will have a number of other benefits. One is brand integrity and consistency. If all of your marketing materials are produced under one roof, then they're all going to be consistent in color and content and quality. Um, you'll also save money if you work with one vendor who can handle everything. Uh, during election season, time is of the essence and you will want your materials in hand within a few days of placing an order, unless it's a really complicated item. Um, you'll want, once you have your items approved, you want your mail dates on the calendar and you'll want to be able to rely on those. And then a hidden cost in any, especially in mail pieces is going to be the postage and every vendor does not process the same skill and have the same experience in processing, ma processing mailing lists, which could result in huge differences on your budget. Um, one other consideration is to use a political consultant um, or work directly with vendors. That's a choice that you'll have to make. Um, there are pluses and minuses with both of those. Um, when we're looking at large, well-financed campaigns, consultants are a valuable commodity to have um, as part of your team. However, on the other hand, when you're looking in more localized races where budgets are much smaller and tighter, not using a consultant is probably a better approach. That way you can put as much money as possible into your campaign. Uh, and then one final consideration when choosing a vendor would be a union versus non-union. Um, that consideration really depends entirely on your, your district or the race that your candidate is running in. You need to have a good understanding of what the constituency is and what the, where the election is taking place. Generally, union materials are going to cost you more than non-union materials, up to about 20% difference in cost. Um, since my company is both union and non-union production facilities, I think I can comment on this in a really non-biased way. Um, campaigns with large budgets generally are not going to feel that difference in cost, and choosing union versus non-union is, is an easy way to go with union. However, where the decision becomes more challenging is in more localized races, uh, where budgets are much smaller and tighter. So if you are not receiving union donations or support and you do not have a large union constituency, then you're likely better off saving money, thereby allowing you to do more with your budget and then going with a non-union printer or you know, provider. Um, supporting union labor in the, in the progressive space is obviously extremely important, but the number one priority should be getting your candidate elected. Um, so let's continue moving along here. Um, now we can get into the actual physical pieces that we're talking about. So with campaign literature, there's a number of things you could do. Uh, you could do direct mail pieces, palm cards and wall cards, door hangers, stationery, and, and some other items. Um, campaign literature is one of the most important tools that the candidate has to communicate to potential voters. So this is even more so on the local level where TV and, TV and radio are generally not in the budget. As a result, you want to make sure that you make the best use of all the tools available to you. Um, think about all the ways that you're going to interact with voters and then how you can brand yourself and communicate in all of those circumstances. Direct mail is a powerful tool that is one of the most, uh, most effective ways to reach voters um, and is a trusted source of information about the candidate. There is an incredible amount to know about direct mail, and we'll go, that, we'll go into that in further detail in a few minutes. Um, much of the contact on a local can that a local candidate will have with voters is via door knocking. Um, there are a number of printed pieces that are important uh, tools to use in this process. Having a palm card to hand out that is well branded and illustrates what the candidate stands for is important to have. Uh, having a leave behind for those who are not home is also a good idea. Uh, additionally, having a card for people to fill out uh, that they can return with questions and ideas is also a nice touch and allows you to make your constituents feel like you're actually listening to them and addressing their cons their concerns. Um, it's also not a bad idea to be wearing a lapel uh, campaign sticker or button um, and even have those to hand out. Uh, door hangers are also a good way uh, to leave things behind so that you can incorporate elements of the palm cards into that as well as suggestion cards. Um, branded campaign stationery is also a good idea and allows for personal notes and other correspondence. Um, and fundraising letters are also a good idea to have in a branded letterhead that you can put into branded envelopes as well. But now let's get into direct mail, which is probably the most complicated uh, space when, we, when we're talking about um, physical materials. 
and there's a lot to know and understand. Um, so starting a mail plan, start, you want to start with uh, creating a mail plan. This allows you to figure out the number of mailings that you want to do, what the subject matter of those mailings will be, who the audience for each of those mailers will be, and what your budget for the overall mail plan is going to be. So some mailers uh, might not go to your full universe, such as, I mean, sorry, some mailers will go to your full universe. That'll likely be you get out the vote and intro pieces. Um, but you might then have some very specific mailers that are addressing very specific issues where you would target those to very specific audiences. So for instance, education, retirees, working families, environmental pieces, a number of other issue spaces that would be very appealing to very specific constituencies, you would use smaller universes uh, when you're mailing to those. So no matter what, having an outline of how many mailings, what the size of each piece will be, and the approximate size of the universe for each mailing is going to be an important tool to initially, one, develop your budget, and then to actually execute um, your mail plan. So when we're talking about direct mail, it's really one of the most credible forms of communication that a campaign has available to them. Good direct mail pieces help cut through the noise, they capture attention, and they compel the recipient to action. Uh, in the case of political mail, the call to action is to vote for a candidate or to support them and get out and volunteer for them. So direct mail's effectiveness in campaigns runs really deep. Uh, a lot of statistics I'm going to cite here are from USPS um, surveys that they do to direct mail recipients uh, after each election cycle. Um, so a lot of people feel that direct mail is one of the most credible forms of political outreach. 68% of people that, survey, that responded to the survey ranked it as one of the most credible sources and it's a channel that voters trust just about more than any other uh, channel. And direct mail is extremely persuasive as well. In crowded fields, good marketing can have a big impact. And 58% of the people surveyed um, said that mailers help them decide on who to vote for and how to vote. Uh, that's important to know and to leverage. And then direct mail is really impactful. The information in your direct mailing goes a long way. 86% um, of voters check their mailboxes at least five times a week. 79% of heads of households sort the mail at their first opportunity. Unlike a 30 second TV spot, mail lingers. It's placed on kitchen tables, desks, and counters, ready to be picked up and read again. Um, and yes, this includes millennials and younger voters as well. While they are, they are more mobile than older voters, they are sufficiently anchored to an address where 91% of millennials will be living at the uh, same address that's on their voter registration come election day. And 79% check their mailbox at least five times a week. 66% do so daily, according to this United Postal Service survey. Um, and then furthermore, the same survey found that for millennials, political mail is more important than email and equally as important as online ads. And because we know that direct mail has a longer connection with the recipient's brain than digital advertisements, we can start to see the impact of budgeting for direct mail for your campaign. So what do you need to know about direct mail? There's a couple of considerations. One is the size classifications. Another is how to process lists. Um, how do you choose your lists? And then again, choosing a vendor specific to mail. So when it comes to mail piece, there are three general sizes that you need to be aware of. Um, all of these, when I, when I use these words, they're not descriptive of the type of mail it is, it's just of the size. So there are three main sizes, which are a postcard, a letter, and a flat. A postcard does not describe everything that you might associate normally as a postcard, but rather simply a mail piece that is up to four and a quarter inches on the short dimension um, and six inches on the larger dimension. Likewise, a letter size piece is not describing a letter as you would conventionally think of it, but normally a mail piece that on its small dimension is six and an eighth or larger. Um, and on its lar I'm sorry, that's up to six and an eighth on its small dimension and up to 11 and a half on the large dimension. Many items that you're familiar with will fall into that, such as postcards that are five by seven, five and a half, eight and a half, six by nine and six by 11 are very common direct mail size pieces that are used in campaigns. And then the final size category is what's called a flat. That covers any mail piece with a short dimension exceeding six uh, and an eighth and a large and the large dimension uh, exceeding 11 and a half inches. So the smaller the piece, the cheaper it will cost to print. 
That said, until you start to get into some really significantly large quantities, the differences in the print costs are not usually significant, um, but also size determines postage rate. Each size classification carries with it a different postage rate. Uh, and depending on the piece, there can be significant postage differences if you were comparing postage costs for a letter versus a flat. Postage generally also is the largest cost component in any direct mailing. Um, and we are talking about, and if we're talking, unless we're talking about complicated mail or we have multiple pieces, such as a fundraising thing where there's a donor card, an envelope, then the print cost is a larger component. But generally for direct mail, the postage is by far the largest component. Now, when we're talking about postage, we have to talk about the levels of service that are available for delivery. Um, so mail can go out in single pieces or small batches. These would require the application of live stamps or metering. Uh, this is generally not how you're gonna send out a direct mail campaign for a political piece. Generally, those are gonna go out bulk mail. So bulk mail requires that the person or the organization mailing um, has a postal permit. Um, that would generally be the mail house. So if we were working on a mailing for you, we have our own uh, postal permits and you don't need to have any of those as a campaign or a consultant or anyone else like that. Um, bulk mail pieces generally have the permit information that's printed on the mail piece. Um, that's commonly known as the indicia and that's usually seen in the upper right corner of that mail piece. Uh, and then the postage gets charged to the account that's associated with that indicia. So bulk mail generally has two basic classes. There's first class and there's standard mail. So first class mail has a higher level of service and on average will be received anywhere in the country in about one to five days. There's also a 500 piece minimum threshold to be able to do a first class bulk mailing. So standard mail has a lower level of service than first class and on average, the mail is generally received anywhere from two to 14 days nationally, depending on where it's going and where it's sent from. Uh, standard mail has a lower threshold for quantity and you can do bulk standard mail from 200 pieces on up. Um, and geography plays a big role in timing when we're talking about standard mail as locations on the other side of the country can take up to two uh, weeks to be received. However, delivery times for most standard mail is still gonna be two to five days. Um, additionally, political bulk mail should be red tagged. That's a process that um, the mail preparer would undergo. Now, when mail is red tagged, the post office is supposed to expedite the processing and standard mail is generally treated more like first class in those cases. Um, so almost all of the political mail that we process, and we do millions of pieces every year, mail is standard and we have excellent success with timely delivery especially for local campaigns where geography is very concentrated. Um, in general, first class mail for political pieces is really not necessary and is a waste of your budget unless it's really last minute and you're trying to target a very narrow window for delivery. Um, nonprofit mail, now that's a discounted version of standard mail. It's generally not available to political campaigns unless the state committee lends out its nonprofit status to a campaign, which only happens on very rare occasions, or a nonprofit entity is sending out a nonpartisan piece, such as encouraging people to register and vote, but not advocating for a specific candidate or policy. So we've done plenty of nonprofit political mailings, but they cannot be partisan in any way. Otherwise, um, you do not have the advantage of using the nonprofit status for that. So postage, not printing, um, has the largest impact on your direct mail budgets. Um, the size of the mail piece, the class of the postage are what commonly determine your postage costs. Uh, postcard size pieces up to four and a quarter by six um, get special di discounted first class rates, but postcard pieces, postcard size pieces and letter size pieces are the same standard postage rate for um, bulk standard. Now, bulk mail allows you to enjoy some truly significant discounts um, in looking at a standard mailing, uh, if you were going to take a piece and send it out first class with a stamp, that would cost you 68 cents for that individual piece. However, if you were to send a piece out as part of a standard bulk mailing, the, the top line number you're going to pay on that mail piece is about 34 cents. Um, and you can never know the exact postage on a bulk mailing until the list is processed at the time of mailing, because the way it sorts and the way it interacts with the postal system and the current 
um, status of each individual address is going to impact that overall cost. Um, now, depending on how the list sorts, we'll determine how many discounts are realized with that. Uh, bulk first class for a letter size piece will come in probably around 50 cents in a bulk mail. And even greater discounts can be realized where there's geographic saturation of the mailing and the mail house processes the list using a process which is called walk sequence processing. And a lot of mail houses don't actually have the capability to do that. So if you're doing especially localized race, you want to make sure whoever you're working with can do walk sequence. This can result in some truly significant postage savings on top of the already bulk discounts that you're getting. Uh, and then when looking at larger mail programs, posted savings can be truly eye-opening when you dig, when you really dig in. A great example of that is uh, we took over a nonprofit's Get Out the Vote campaign in 2020, um, and they had previously been doing that using first-class mailing. However, they're a national nonprofit and has the access to get uh, bulk nonprofit um, discounts. The pieces they were sending out were completely nonpartisan and just encouraging people to get out and vote or either register to vote. Um, this was millions of pieces of mail. And what we did is we actually recommended that the client use their nonprofit status to send these out bulk nonprofit. Um, and in order to, all we had to do was actually incorporate a little more time in there because the national um, delivery rates on standard mail are a little less than, as I discussed, first class. But we did that. And in the end, we wound up saving this um, client over $500,000 in postage, which is truly an eye-opening uh, amount. Um, so then the other things to consider are how you process your lists. Now, the way a list is processed has a really big impact, as we discussed, on the cost of overall postage. Um, standard bulk processing will get you standard bulk discounts. However, there are a few things in basic processing that impact both your cost and delivery times. So as I mentioned earlier, red tagging political mail generally expedites the processing and delivery times. Um, this needs to be noted on the mailing when the list is processed and when it's entered into the USPS system. So additionally, where the mail is dropped will also have a big impact on postage cost. So most local post offices are the last point of contact for the mail system that is being delivered and also the first point of contact for when something is entered into the mail stream. However, dropping a bulk mailing at the local post office will actually result in the smallest bulk discounts, well, while dropping a mailing at a major sorting facility will result in much higher discounts. So this is an important consideration when you're selecting a vendor. Um, you should know how and where they drop their mail. Um, there's also additional processing that can be done, as I mentioned, with walk sequence, where there is a very uh, concentrated geography on your mailing list. Um, and then once that concentration kicks in and you do that walk sequence processing, for instance, on a standard mail piece where I said earlier the, uh, the, the cost would be about 34 cents each, we just did a bunch of uh, mailings for some uh, primaries where the lists were very localized and we got the per piece postage down to about 23 cents. So you can really, really realize some significant postage savings by the way that the lists are processed. Now, it's a little more labor intensive when you process something for walk sequence. So the cost to process that way is a little bit of additional cost, but you could be saving thousands of dollars in postage and it more than outweighs that additional processing cost. So another thing to consider when you're talking about doing some direct mail is choosing your lists. So it's important to know who a particular mailing is going to, go, is going to be received by. Uh, that's called the universe. So a universe can be as large as the entire electorate or as small as a very targeted mail piece designed to only reach specific people with specific demographics. So often lists that you're going to use in your mailings can be attained by the state party or from state secretary of state. Lists can often show who was registered, who was voted and previ and who was voted previously and where they live. Um, you can also get lists from list services that would really allow you to dial down on some demographics of just about every kind, including household makeup, um, if someone's a homeowner or a renter, income levels, if there's children in the home, and many other valuable data points that you can then use to target your mail pieces and speak very directly to the issues that might concern these particular voters. Um, 
different mail pieces based on the subject matter will dictate who you mail to and obviously the size of the universe. So one other method that you can use for mailing is called EDDM, which is Every Door Direct, which is a program that the post office has and allows you to saturate entire mail routes and receive truly significant discounts. However, you also do not need a list for this type of mailing because you're hitting every address on a, on a, um, on a particular mail route. Uh, the one thing about EDDM, though, is it's not often used in political campaigns because uh, more often than not, Democrat campaigns are not going to want to activate Republican campaign uh, voters and vice versa. Republican candidates are not going to want to activate Democrat voters. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and with mail, even more than other printed pieces, choosing your vendor is truly vitally important. So a good starting point for choosing a vendor would be to talk with experienced candidates, campaign managers, and people at your state or local town committee. Um, ask them who they recommend and why. And you definitely do not want to randomly reach out to just anyone, as all vendors are most definitely not created equal, especially when it comes to political mail. So things that you should consider in, when using and choosing a vendor um, is do they have all of those services under one roof? As we discussed earlier, time savings is really important. Um, maybe you know a printer who does not have in-house mailing services. Maybe you know a mail house who does not print. Elections move fast um, and time is of the essence. Uh, time will be lost when dealing with multiple vendors when it comes to communication. Um, you also lose time moving the printed piece from a printer to a mail house. Generally, unless quantities are extremely high, all political mailings are proof printed and mailed out within a few days once we're really into the uh, high gear of election season. And additionally, anyone who does not have all of these services under one roof is not going to have the overall expertise that you want to rely on. So again, as we discussed earlier, should you be using a union vendor? Um, as, as, I, as I mentioned, that's really something that you're going to know more than the vendor would know. You just need to know your local um, area. If it is highly impacted by um, unions, union constituency, then you should absolutely be using a union vendor. Um, if unions do not play a huge role in your local race, then, then you can forego that and, and obviously have a, a cost savings. So some good questions that you should be asking of any vendor when you're considering working with them include the following. What is your experience in working with political mail? Do you uh, do all of your work in-house? What type of post office facility do you drop your bulk mail at? Do you ever walk sequence uh, process pieces? Um, can you provide references of past political clients? And do you red tag your mail? So that kind of covers, there's a lot more that I can get into minutia of and you can feel free to reach out. I can answer any questions on mail. Uh, there's a few other political uh, printed and physical pieces that we can cover now. Um, and one of them and most common, one of the most common things in political campaigns are lawn signs. Uh, there are often disagreements in the political space about lawn signs. Uh, some people think that they don't do anything and other people swear by them. I'm of the opinion that lawn signs are an invaluable tool. Um, they're a gift that kind of keeps on giving. One of the most important things in politics and at the ballot box is name recognition. This is in part why incumbents fare so well in many elections. People often will fail to truly research a candidate, what a candidate stands for, but they are often comfortable voting for someone who they know, or at least they think they know because their name is familiar to them. Um, politics is like marketing, and in marketing, it's a well-known fact that it often takes eight to 12 touches before someone takes a desired action. Um, signs are a great way to keep getting a candidate in front of people over and over. Um, that lawn sign or banner that people drive by every day for a month or more goes a long way to building acceptance and recognition. They also help to build trust. Um, the more neighbors that have a lawn sign out for a candidate, the more likely someone is going to be comfortable with that candidate because people they know are comfortable with them. The same is true with like posters and rally signs. Um, another great way to take the brand with a candidate wherever they go at a minimal investment is with a branded banner stand. Um, they're easy to set up, easy to break down, and easy to, and they're small, come in a small carry case, and allows mobile branding for events, town halls, and other opportunities where the candidate is going to speak, and they can then have their brand seen. Um, banners are also fairly inexpensive, um, and they're large and easily seen, 
And if you have opportunities for high profile placement of banners or oversized signs, that's something to really take advantage of. Um, another great tool is magnets, large magnets that you can put on the side of a car um, for the candidate or campaign members are an inexpensive way to essentially have a rolling billboard and spread the brand everywhere you go. Um, you can also make small car magnets to give or sell uh, and to your supporters who in turn become rolling billboards for you. Uh, bumper stickers are along the same lines as those smaller magnets. Um, other promotional materials that you can consider if budget allows would also be branded items such to reward your supporters, such as stickers, pens, buttons, and other collateral that could all be helpful um, items to employ in your campaign. And that pretty much covers it. That was a lot of material. So what we can do now is I will switch off the share and then I can take any questions that you might have. All right, let's look through. Um, uh, so I'm not seeing any questions. I'm not sure if anybody wants to hop in with any questions. Um, if not, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions, whether it be simply to uh, help you point you in the dire right direction with your campaign. If you're looking for pricing on a particular thing, if you're looking for local vendors in your market, I can probably help recommend some people as well. Um, or if you're just looking to uh, sort out how you go about putting different campaign pieces together, happy to do so. So I can stay for a few minutes if anyone has any, let's see, the Q&A. No, nothing in the Q&A. I said Veronica has a question. I'm looking at that right now. So Veronica is asking, are you familiar with situations in which the state Democrats PACs are handling the mailers, especially for frontline campaigns? And there are concerns about the quality and messaging. I've been listening to Dirt Road organizing about two campaigns in very red rural Maine that had experience and had to take it over themselves. Heard of any situations like that or any suggestions? Um, so I've actually worked on certain on campaigns that are all around the country. And what you're saying there is all 100% true. And what I had mentioned earlier, only you are gonna know your district, whether that be a congressional house district, whether it be a local city where you're running for mayor, you're gonna know and the people that are on your campaign are gonna know that district best what uh, appeals to the people in that district what visuals might be working better um, and that's why you always want to avoid um, taking up the state party line or the national party line and make that you know you in in integrate that client's brand into what you're doing so if you're having funding issues if part of that is that this, a state or a pack a state committee or a pack is funding your mailing um, the best thing to do is to have a frank conversation with them and get input. Um, while you don't want to turn away something that someone is going to pay for, you also don't want to have promotional materials that are going out to your potential voters that are going to put your client in a bad light, whether it be by the quality of the materials or by um, just the messaging that's on there. <clears throat> I'm on a lot of national like progressive calls um, on a weekly basis. And this type of thing is actually a big discussion when we're talking about communicating with Latinos. Uh, a lot of um, campaigns will put together information uh, that are English based and then we'll use like basic translators as opposed to people that actually know the nuance of the language and the message is not conveyed. It's kind of a similar situation. Um, so it's something where you, you definitely need to stay in control of your campaign and you definitely need to be you know driving if you're the one that's the advocate for your candidate driving what the message is and how you're going to communicate so let's see veronica has a couple more input here um so okay so what you're saying is a lot of the materials when you're dealing with the statewide or these packs are generic and don't generate voter confidence 
So again, the best thing to do is you don't want to turn away free money or somebody that's contributing, you know, to your campaign that you otherwise wouldn't have. But at the same time, if they're putting out, and, and the thing is too, the campaign cannot coordinate directly with any PACs because um, then you'd be in violation of campaign finance. Um, but there's got to be a way through intermediaries where you can, you know, get the information that you want into those, uh, into the, um, put into the pieces. Let's see. Do you know of cases where caucus will just hand over some money instead of controlling the materials? Um, so what I would say about that, Veronica, is I've worked with a number of, I work with a lot of DC consultants and through that we've worked with PACs that um, where the cons part of that is also making sure that the consultants that are working on this know the candidate and are well immersed. So I've done a number of mailings for consultants that are for PACs and the PAC is directly advocating for the candidate. Uh, but on the ones that I've worked on with that, the, the messaging, the imagery and everything was, you know, very consistent with who the candidate really was. Um, but again, that's a sticky situation because you cannot communicate directly with PACs. Otherwise you go, you know, you're in violation of campaign finance. So the best thing to do would be to find a way to connect and give them the information that you want to be, con you know, to conveyed, um, and make available to them imagery and things like that, but without having it be a direct contact. Because the last thing you want to do is cause some kind of a um, legal issue for your candidate before election day. So I'm not sure if that covers kind of everything. Yeah. Oh, and then Veronica, you're also asking about hand like where cases where caucuses will just hand over some money instead of controlling the materials. Um, if you're talking about PACs, that's definitely not going to happen because that would be a campaign finance violation. But I have worked on more local campaigns where um, the candidate specifically, the campaign is paying for a mailing or some type of uh, collateral piece but then either the state or the town committee actually contributes. So we've had plenty of situations where we'll do a mailing and say it's $5,000. Um, the client will then tell us, hey, can you bill 40% of this to the campaign, 20% to the state committee and 20% to the town committee? Um, that's a way to kind of try and integrate money into there. Yeah, if you're talking about caucuses, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure specifically if you run a mock of campaign finance with that. Obviously, with PACs, you do. I'm not sure about caucuses. If you're talking, are you talking about like the state, like a state committee or something different than that? Um, yeah, Veronica, what I can also do if you email me, I can like uh, raise that question up to some consultants and others that I work with and get some input from them as well. Um, but I definitely don't want to be giving you an answer that specific that will cause any kind of campaign finance issues or, you know, cause you any issues in other ways. Um, so that one's a little gray for me, but I definitely have people that I work with regularly who have been in the middle of those situations. So if you want to email me, I can kind of pose that question to a few others and get you some answers. Um, so it looks like if there's not any other questions, um, I'm done with my presentation and I can give you back uh, some more of your time, uh, about 10 minutes of your time. And then again, if anybody has any questions, feel to reach out at any time and I'd be happy to, uh, you know, help in any way I can. So I'd like to wish everyone a great day and have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll talk to some of you soon. Goodbye.